I'm Aaron Hunter with Engine Pro. I'm Dan Bagley from King Engine Bearings. Today we're going to talk about engine bearing failure. What goes into this? What happens? How do all these things happen? We've seen it a million times. Engine bearing gets spun. Engine bearing looks like mush. I mean, yep. they look cooked. All sorts of stuff. From your perspective, you've seen a lot of this. What's the number one thing that you see that is the common issue? The common issue, Aaron, is debris. 45% of engine bearings failures are from debris. Now, a lot of times people look at a bearing and say, oh, you know, it was a rod bearing failure. But the rod bearing is getting oil from off of the main bearing. So in, in many cases, you, if you get debris, uh, what, what it does is it creates an obstruction in the film pressure. So as your, your oil wants to flow very smoothly through, through the bearing, uh, if you get debris in there, it causes a high spot. Mm -hmm. When you create a high spot, and when the oil comes and hits it, it creates, the oil has to split to get past that high spot. When it splits, it creates a low pressure right behind it, and that will be the start of the failure mode. So when you get low, low when the oil diverts out, you get the low uh, pressure, you get minimum oil film thickness, so at that point, the crankshaft starts connecting and with with the the bearing, and you get contact going on it. So a lot of times you get debris, and it'll break the oil film on the main bearing, which starves the rod bearing for oil. Mm. So typically, what happens when that happens is a lot of people look and say, "Oh, I had a rod bearing failure," and I've, I've had many people come up and I've read failure reports and go, oh, we had rod bearing failure and I was like eh, that's like the secondary effect of it the debris broke the oil film in the main bearing which decreased the amount of oil going to the rod bearing starved the rod bearing and the rod bearing start to overheat it goes through the overlay it starts showing some bronze and then at that point it starts to get really hot and the bearing starts collapsing on itself when it starts collapsing on itself, it'll grab the crankshaft and it wants to ride with the crankshaft and not stay stationary in the connecting rod and the bearing spins and may or may not break a connecting rod. But um, debris is, is, creates a diversion and a film pressure change which drives what oil feeds the rod bearings. So the oil is doing two purposes, what you're telling me is that it's, the oil is not only a, a lubricity film, but it's mm -hmm. also carrying away heat. Correct. It's basically, it's, it's the, in, the, the coolant of the internal of the engine. Yeah, there's a lot of engineering that goes into bearings and, and the flow because you need a certain amount of oil flow, just like a radiator. Mm -hmm. uh, you need a certain amount of air to go through it to cool your engine. You need a certain amount of oil that's going to leak past the bearing to pull the heat out because otherwise if you seal the bearing up, then it would have no way to get rid of it and you would just build up heat, build up heat to finally a point. Again, uh, the, every material has a melting point. If you exceed that melting point, you get, you get failure mode. So there's two ways. You need flow, but you also need it consistent. And uh, the, the rod bearing is most of the time the sacrificial part of debris and they'll look at and pick the rod bearing as a failure, but it really started earlier. What kind of debris are we talking about? Are we talking like grains of sand, or are we talking about smaller, finer? It, it's, in, in journal, con, journal to bearing, we're, we're talking just a couple microns. Uh, you know, a human hair split in six ways. That much is the clearance uh, that you have between the journal and the bearing. So. Debris can be anything from the conditions. If somebody's rebuilding an engine, they have debris that, you know, a, a guy's doing fabrication next to them. Uh, they didn't clean their workbench properly okay. before they... Uh, we didn't smoke. brush out our, our oil galleys right. and things like yeah. that after we've gone through the baking process and, and on a rebuild, yeah. all of that. Uh, there's numerous ways. Uh, cleaning the block. You hone a block. How do you hone a block? You, you're removing material with grit. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you have... Hones, the hone stones break down. Sure. Uh, you have coolant going through the block when you're honing to make sure everything's right and perfect and round and straight. But if you don't clean the block well enough, um, that happens. Uh, people glass bead components of the engine because they you know need to clean them. Oh sure. Uh, you know grinding wheels if they're cleaning off gasket surfaces. 
and you know there's numerous things that you can you can use so it's uh, it's not specific to anything in particular it's a combination of environments uh, tooling that you use the machining the the cleanliness it's just the bottom line of cleanliness uh, you know what's around the assembly table when you're assembling the engine are you are you are you assembling in the you know outside or you have a controlled room <laughs> right variables right. they're all yeah. variables makes a big difference makes mm -hmm. a big difference so then what about oil breakdown if if we've gone through debris do we and we talk about the oil being a major major component as far as lubricity and as far as thermal we do know that the oil will over time become contaminated with micro particles that that move freely through an oil filter and then also the uh, alkaline acidic state of, of an oil right. we've learned recently those things are causing major factors right i mean oil oil life has been stretched as we all know mm -hmm. you know what the how long the engines go you know engines are, are more efficient uh, you know base what they were years ago and so with the efficiency there's less carbon carbon is very abrasive mm -hmm. uh, so that that makes the the length of service of between oil changes longer okay so but there, there's a risk to that too you know people always push and <laughs> I'm busy you know I'm a prime example well, I'm busy and I'm a bearing guy I'm busy to, to get my oil changed and you, you overuse it so as your oil gets contamination you know quality oil quality filter mm -hmm. uh, key because the filters are are based off of what percentage of microns they will filter mm -hmm. percentage not a hundred percent right it's a percentage so as the 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 filtration goes does or does not work uh, you, you can get contamination in there and mm -hmm. then once you get contamination in there it's kind of like a snowball oh, yeah. uh, you know, once you get something in there it kind of eats away and it, 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 bearings have embeddability so there's amount of embeddability that that part can sit and it will embed and it will stay in there and again when that happens it creates with fluid going in there, it creates a wall and then it breaks. Well, there's nothing on the side of an engine bearing to keep the oil in. So as it breaks, instead of going straight, it blows out to the side and mm -hmm. decreases the oil. To your point, uh, oil, you know, quality of oil, uh, inexpensive oil has less additives. Sure. So additives are key to making the engines live not going to get into a whole bunch of oils right now but you know quality oil uh and then length time any any oil that sits in a vehicle whether you're using it or not has a time period where it starts to to change the acidity of it bearings are not very user friendly when acid touches them mm. so then you get a component breakdown specifically if it's a if it's a plated bearing, you get breakdown of the overlay, which is what keeps the bearing from seizing. Sure. So, you know, old oil, and typically when you see oxidation in a bearing corrosion, it's, it's speckled with spots, and it starts to deteriorate the overlay of it. Oh my gosh, And once wow. it starts to deteriorate, at that point you get fatigue off of it, and, and chunks start coming off of it. And then when you get chunks coming off of it, Talk about disruption in the oil film. Yeah. Now all of a sudden you got this big hole, and the oil says, "Up, oh, I'm out of here," and fill your mode. It starts flowing like the Grand Canyon. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's not a good thing. Now, if if we're we've got a clean environment, we're changing our oil regularly. What about our engine components? Obviously, everything works in in play together. We know that that an engine block is mm -hmm. as robust as it is. There's flex in it. I mean, especially when you when you put two engine plates on a drag race block and then you bolt it into a rigid chassis. You're oh right. My gosh. right. Uh, but we see flex going into other engine components, even just on a on a regular run of the mill daily driver. Mm -hmm. um, most of these guys are going to be working on race engines. How often should we be re replacing rods? Is regardless of how expensive they are, how often do you think we should be considering that that rod might have reached its fatigue life and it's starting yeah. to go from a rigid state to a plastic state maybe. Right, you, you know, as an engine fires, we, we're assuming everybody has this perfectly round connecting rod housing that puts the bearing in there and it, it's a perfect world. 
until the engine fires, yeah. right? So you're running down the track or uh, pulling something heavy and, and you're using a lot of torque on that engine and a, a rod will ovalize. Mm -hmm. And there's, we designed a bearing to conform to some ovalization, some deformation of the, of the housing board itself. And typically when you have your beam coming up, the deformation is going to come at 10 and 2. Okay. Is where it's going to come in. So the because of the cross section of the beam, so it's, it's the rods flexing like this. It's stretching, right? So as it's moving, it causes fatigue. So mm -hmm. a lot of times there, there's people say, "Oh, I had a I had a rod bearing failure because the the our, the the rod is is in the oil pan." Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I looked at I pulled pieces. I love pulling pieces out of oil pans. To help people out, not that I love pulling, pulling. <laughs> but uh, you know, you see the rod bearing is black. Yeah. Right. Well, that's an indication that the rod bearing was pinching, got too hot. Okay. And end up losing the oil film stuck to the connecting rod, which then snapped the rod off. So typically, uh, you know, when you see a pieces in the oil pan, and I, I again, I always go through and try to recreate the, the crime scene yeah. uh, of what happened. And, and I, I say it a thousand times, parts never lie, it's just knowing what they're telling you. Sure. And when, when a part is black, it says it got hot. So if the rod, if the rod bearing got hot, why did it get hot? If the, if the, the engine oil is not taking away that heat from it, well, where's the engine oil? And in, in certain cases, you may not have enough because of the deformation of the connecting rod. It, as long as you keep a connecting rod, they have a cycle. Because mm -hmm. as you keep working it, eventually you start getting fatigues. They usually get some uh, pitting, mm -hmm. and then the pitting will connect to each other, and crack propagation starts out of pitting's connecting. And when the more it works, the more pitting you get, the pitting turns into the less strength, mm -hmm. which means the rod bearing has to accommodate for more and then you get journal the bearing contact which creates the heat to a point uh, that you just get failure mode. <laughs> wow. I mean there's there's a lot that goes into all of this. What about unfortunately but true and I think it's true for most all of us user error. Ooh. You know there there's a percentage um, and we're all human mm -hmm. and you know the bearing I've, I've seen issues where, again, the, the guy's done a great job, but there's some debris, or the guy next, he goes to lunch, and the guy next to him is doing something and he gets aluminum chips or something. Uh, you know, the, the bearing itself, I've seen debris on the back side of the bearing. Oh, wow. And which at that time will shape the design of the bearing where you actually get a, a dip in there. Well, again, it's all about oil flow. I mean, oil flow, you want small fluid. You get that dip that changes where the pressure, oil film pressure is, and creates a failure right after that because now there's no film thickness mm -hmm. and you've created a, a tight spot in the bearing. You may measure it up and they're like perfect until you get a piece of debris yeah. under it or on this side of it, mm -hmm. either one's effect. The other thing is people will, will snap in bearings and they have the, the locating tang. Sure. All right, the locating tang is, is wonderful to locate so you don't get into the crank radius, uh, means our rods, and you know exactly where it's gonna be front to rear of the engine. So, but the problem is the tangs are cut in and they may not get, they may push the bearing down too far where it stands tall on this side and the tang is pushing it into the housing. I think the one saving grace here on this user error is, is uh, you and I have both seen that, yes, it's happened with, with the Shade Tree mecha mechanic, but it's also happened with the best engine builders. Absolutely. And uh, sometimes that's, that takes a little bit of sweat off the brow and it's like, okay, those guys made a mistake too. So um, you, your practice, your methodology, all plays a part in, in how well these engine barriers are gonna last as far as your cleanliness of space, your practice of how you're putting them into the engine, mm -hmm. uh, into the rods, all of that, and then your torque sequences. We were just talking about how over torquing a specific Ford EcoBoost ovals and actually deloads the engine bearing. Thank you, Aaron.